Good morning, BookTube. We are back. This is ML Clark with Better World Theory YouTube Edition. I am joined, as ever, by my special guest, The Highway. So every now and then, you might not hear the truck sounds and the car sounds and the rooming motorcycles, but if you see my face contort a little bit, or if you hear me lose my train of thought, that might just be because of my environment. And yet, there is something perfectly suited to our topic about the disruptions of mechanical technology. One of the core themes and tensions within speculative fiction is between the Holy Triumvirate, and the Holy Triumvirate will definitely come up in today's uh, review of Clark's World, the April edition. The Holy Triumvirate, as I call it, is human intelligence, non-human organic intelligence, and non-human mechanical intelligence. And a great deal of our writing in the science fiction realm is about the tensions between these three, the sense of borders, if borders exist between these three, and the echoes in the way that many different kinds of, of entities move through our world. It will come up a lot in the stories in Clark's world this month. It comes up in fiction in general. It comes up in the world. And I think this is the core reason that I want to talk about Clark's world on a monthly basis. Clark's world not only has stories that deal with these intersections, Clark's world also lives these in these tensions. And as I've mentioned before, last year I really kind of broke <laughs> uh, in some ways. I had a lot of world grief, as I call it, because of how many terrible things were going on in the world. Um, it was also not a good time. I have not had a good few years. I've had a lot of difficulty on a personal level too. But between the two of those, between the world's many problems and a lot of my personal issues, there was this industry that affects a kind of prescience. It affects a sense of being able to anticipate innovation, societal innovation, technological innovation, and respond maturely and thoughtfully to those new challenges. And yet, when faced with a very material challenge in its own realm, it could not, for the life of it, rise above its moment. And that was really hard. And so I understand on some levels why people could not rise to the challenge better, because we are all strained right now in a socioeconomic context that requires us to play the game in a certain way. All science fiction communities are regional communities. All of them have geopolitical biases, and they are especially in Western publishing oriented around whether you know the right people through workshops and conferences. The publishing is extremely biased. There's no real meritocracy in it. Uh, that doesn't mean that a lot of wonderful work doesn't get published, but it's not really in competition with the full world. And that's important to remember only because at the same time that it is a regional literature, like all literatures are regional, Western publishing is seen as having more money than other publishing contexts. And so because it is more affluent, it gains a sense of being more universal and more coveted. And that means you have a lot of the world clamoring to get into this regional lit literary context. To publish in this regional literary context, even if you aren't from the region, is the height of success because this region is affluent. That's really what it comes down to. And that's extremely important to remember when we talk about what happened to Clark's World last year and how it became the center of a storm that completely missed the point. So, last year, in the middle of a surging hype cycle around AI, the immediate panic point was, oh my goodness, now it's finally hitting us. It's going to hit my set of creators. And part of what frustrated me is that exploitative technologies like this have been abused in many different realms and often by writers and other creators in many different spaces of their lives without complaint because it didn't affect us directly. And then suddenly it did affect us directly and suddenly the panic emerged but still not at the right target. Clark's World last year was the, one of the first mainstream publications to be inundated by chatbots uh, and, and their output. So inside a lot of our writing about it, when we talked about it as so-called AI, we talked about AI submissions. It's not artificial intelligence. These are large language models 
These are, this is a new algorithmic tool that is sifting through pre-existing data and synthesizing it in a way that responds to the prompts that's been given. And the really important aspect of what happened is that Clark's World, yes, had a huge surge in this AI spam, if you want to call it that, or chatbot spam, LLM spam. But the phenomenon of spam, the idea of people trying to fake a submission and, and send it in, is not new. The technology allowed it to be done at scale, but as even Neil Clark hinted at, but very delicately, there are parts of the world where you will find many people submitting this kind of spam to the Western publishing economy because it is an economy that has more potential uh, for, for high revenue, if it succeeds. The price point that one gets, the author pay that people grumble about even in North America because it's nowhere near what the equivalent might have been in certain other eras, is still extremely high compared even to other publications uh, in the industry. Clark's World is exceptionally high. And yet, even more so, it's a year's salary, if not over that, in many other parts of the world. So the incentive for trying to get in and to use whatever new technology exists to try, try your luck at the draw, essentially, makes it very clear why individuals are spamming a lot of these publications. It's not this disembodied intelligence coming solely out of artificial realms. It is human beings in a world that is unequal, coveting these publications that have affected a kind of universality or, uh, or, or broader gloss and can affect that kind of gloss because they are more affluent, because they are situated in countries and in cultural contexts that are more affluent. So if you want to worry about the spam problem, you have to first remember what is causing the spam in general. And then you have this new technology that comes along that makes it a little bit easier, a little bit faster to do this work, but the underlying human behavior is the same. So that's one side of things. At the same time that everyone was panicking, and when I say this, a lot of people I heard in my industry were panicking. They're like, oh, but now I'll never get into Al Clark's world because they might have to shut down before I can get in, or they might have to shut down because of the spam. AI is killing my ability to be seen in, this, in the slush pile. Yeah, y yeah, yes, to an extent. But again, the anxiety is far too narrowly situated. At the same time that we had this AI scandal, and the hype cycle thankfully is reaching a, a tipping point. We'll see how that plays out, but hopefully soon. Neil Clark, like many others in the genre, there are people who have been calling attention to this consistently, also tried to raise the alarm about the real threat to the short fiction publishing industry, to speculative fiction in general, to our economy in general, and it is not from this Skynet-esque disembodied threat of AI. It's from the corporations that routinely value scrape and use whatever technology, whatever new process comes along to help further that aim. So specifically, Neil Clark and a few others were emphatically talking about the fact that the publishing landscape for short fiction has become so dangerously narrowed around digital productions that Amazon having secured a monopoly over these publications, was finally able to bring down the axe and tighten controls over what individual publishers can do, what kind of autonomy they have on the Amazon platform. And this meant that a lot of short fiction publishers suddenly did not have access to the subscriber list. They couldn't keep and curate their own subscription models. They also don't necessarily have control over price points the same way because Amazon is finding any way possible to scrape value from individual creators. But this isn't as flashy and exciting as talking about AI. It's going to come after us. It's going to destroy us. And I, I really did feel disillusioned when I saw how difficult it was to have a conversation about the real problems because everyone was so panicked on the individual level about their specific livelihood. And at the same time, it was a little unfair of me because we're all just human beings trying our best. I've had a lot of problems these last few years. A lot of others are stressed as well. But the problem for me then was science fiction, as much as the field and the genre, the aesthetic tries to imagine the world ahead, 
is still populated by people who often can't, for whatever reason. So I shifted to nonfiction for a while in terms of pouring my focus into news analysis, explainers, focusing on media literacy, focusing on science literacy, until I hit a breaking point there as well, uh, pretty much at the end of last year, when I realized that people don't necessarily want to hear what's true. And that's where the cycle came full circle. And I remembered, right, we are a species that needs good narrative. We need a good story to be able to hang all other aspects of our life on. We will not be receptive to new data that disrupts too much the standing narrative of our culture. And this is where fiction plays a role. We need fiction to help nudge that sense of a general cultural narrative, to move it forward, to imagine new possibilities. So that was my emotional year. And it definitely was framed around Clark's World. Clark's World, though, has a wonderful realm of storytelling unto itself. And so outside of all of these industry concerns, let's talk about the issue itself. As always, I want to celebrate the actual work that is going on in our genre so that we can see what is at risk and what we are losing. I will say, though, part of the reason I'm a little emphatic this morning about this publication is the editorial. And I didn't talk about the editorial last time. I missed that in my uh, first summary. But the editorial this time is one of two possible editorials. Neil Clark wrote two, and he shared the more positive, the more upbeat of the two. And yet I am pretty sure I can surmise what the other one might have been. When he wrote the two, it was after a few weeks of expressing online concern about the fact that the Amazon publishing model has directly impacted income streams in a way that has been difficult for Clark's World to recover from. Neil Clark has been talking about this for years. As much as we want access to free speculative fiction, and again, this is a free-to-read issue, and as much as we at the same time demand authors deserve high payment, we somehow magically want the funding for that payment to come out of the ether, and it cannot. It act, we need to materially invest in these publications if we want them to succeed. And we aren't doing that. And we haven't been doing that for a very long time. So outside of the disembodied realities of what causes people to submit spam in the first place to submissions queues, outside of the fact that we have normalized and resigned ourselves to corporate monopoly absolutely destroying a full range of possibilities in our publishing platform, we also as individuals just don't necessarily put our money where our mouth is and actually try to pay to support a publication in our sphere. And we need to do that. So there'll be links, obviously, in the show notes. And show notes makes it sound very fancy, but you know, the information bar underneath the YouTube video uh, to link you to the Patreon for Clark's World. Uh, as well as other subscription venues. But if, if Clark's World's not your publication, that's fine. Maybe you more on the horror side, more on the fantasy side. That's okay. But if you love reading something, you enjoy the work and the craft and the curation that goes into it, and if you can afford the cost of a cup of, uh, of drip coffee, in some cases, chuck a little change their way. If not more, go for a full latte's worth. You never know. Okay. So the the editorial this month was a positive saying okay we just barely made it on the positive side of things we don't need to, to publish a really grim editorial but clark's world for all that it has this impression of being an institution and of being you know so stable and top tier that obviously uh it is it's always going to be there is fragile and vulnerable and I don't want to see the other editorial anytime soon. I don't want to see the report that says that Clarksville has to scale down operations. So I really hope that we can try to avoid that end. Okay, that little rant over. Uh, some of you will not be able to see the screen, so you will not be able to see this beautiful cover as well, uh, but it is a really generous, lovely one. Uh, I quite enjoy the, the thematic resonance of this one, and I think it fits the issue quite well. Uh, as noted, that holy triumvirate for science fiction or certain kinds, we have dystopic fiction, we have utopian fiction, we have stories that focus on aliens as a kind of cipher for certain parts of our own reality, the other that reflects aspects of ourselves back to us. But 
we have this lovely balance between human intelligence, non-human organic intelligence, and mechanical intelligence, and the tension and interplay between those are always uh, a key core theme in genre, because it is a key core theme in our world. And on this cover, we have these giant hermit crabs moving through this uh, plains environment. It's like a marshland, you've got some field, you've got some water, and in this world be between worlds, again, that's a lovely detail to have already the shift between water and land, while you also have hermit crabs, giant hermit crabs, using decaying old abandoned tankers, uh, cargo ships, whatever they've found abandoned in, the, in this landscape as their homes. So their new shells are our detritus, as always, but it's just that our detritus is now at a massive scale. And I've mentioned scale and its importance to uh, Clark's World covers before. Scale is very important for establishing a sense of wonder and that sense of awe and dread at the same time. So of course this is a tender moment because we see hermit crabs, but also it should be this moment of very humbling reflection on the detritus that we are leaving and which is then becoming part of the ecosystem in which these creatures move. It's just a really beautiful resonant cover. And Hermit Crab Walker is its name and it was uh, created by Long Chue Chen. So beautiful work and I expect to see that at the end of the year there's always a list uh, sort of contest for everyone's favorite cover. I really hope it, 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 it gets a, a high rating because it's just a very cleverly done piece. Okay, and as I said, it resonates with the actual content, which comes from very good curation. So a, a well-curated issue in my mind is going to have resonant themes, resonant concepts manifesting in very different ways, so you can see an issue from different sides. And I think that this issue, which is quite robust, has a lot of really good reading in it, um, covers that range quite beautifully. Now, the first piece by Eliana Castroianni is The Lark Ascending. The Lark Ascending is a musical piece, and there is also fable that comes up in this publication, uh, in the story. The story is being told through an intelligent non-person helper. So it is one of many, 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 many stories in science fiction that imagines the world through the perspective of the, the sort of robot helper in a domestic context. It is a story that has this character observing one person's death in a culture that is extremely rigid and definitely seems to be authoritarian uh, and transitioning into a role for the daughter of the person who dies. I'm being very careful about how I say this because I don't want to take away from the, the, the pleasure of the piece. The fable component though is really lovely. The fable inside the story, the rose and the bee, is something that comes from a, a natural context, as you can tell from the very elements of the story, the rose and the bee, but which reflect a concept that grafts perfectly onto our relationship to technology as well. So it doesn't need to necessarily be an organic truth uh, to be something that is resonant to what we're moving through. The rose and the bee, as is explained in this piece, imagines the fact that two aspects of our world can be created pretty much together in lock sync. They are uh, intrinsically related. The bee needs the flower, the flower needs the bee. And even if one element goes away after, the other is going to retain the shape it holds, the form it holds, and the form that it held from that earlier interaction. So it becomes an echo of the past interaction. And it's a beautiful concept on which to hang a story about the work being done by a helper figure for one life, after that life goes away, then moving towards being present in whatever life remains. So I won't say more about the story except to say that it is a, a very fluid look at how the fabulous storytelling that came before science fiction blends perfectly in with a lot of the themes of speculative fiction today, as it should. Speculative fiction has certain commercial genres. It has core concepts of science fiction that have emerged within a Western context within the last century. But speculative fiction itself 
spans all of human writing. So it shouldn't be surprising that whenever we talk about new themes, whether it's with artificial intelligence or not, we're still talking about something we have discussed for a very, very long time as a species. Okay, the next piece is <laughs> really quite tender as well. And you often get this generosity with these stories. This is an intergalactic smuggler's guide to homecoming and it's by Tia Tashiro. And it involves, as it suggests, a smuggler. The framing of the story is, again, quite resonant with a lot of realities of our world. Science fiction, even when set in far-flung contexts, is always about the world today. And you will see that in a lot of the anxieties and contexts that emerge within it. So we have a character who is born on a kind of podunk, transformed world. Uh, the terraformed world she was born into with her twin was not the best, not the worst, but kind of forgotten, and a lot of people's lives were kind of neglected because of that. They're just in the middle, in the lurch. And she wants to get off of this world, which has so few possibilities to her mind. Her sister decides to stay uh, because her sister gets a job offer that allows her some level of comfort and security within that world. And Miko feels very betrayed by that because she had these plans. She and her sister were going to leave. They were going to run away and find something better. Miko takes the smuggling route where she becomes a smuggler of non-organic, non-living life to try to make enough money to be able to get out for good. Until one day, she is given a task to smuggle sentient beings. And she's very good at it. And she does. And so you have all these very tiny little um, fingernail-sized jellyfish creatures, which are clinging to her spine in this bag that she's wearing, and have avoided detection by certain metrics, but need her touch to be able to pass through security in in entirely. They come from a world where they, too, are not given rights and freedoms as much as others around them and so um, she and they are very resonant and there's a lot of really nuanced world building there because part of the reason that they did not have rights individually is because they were first catalog cataloged as a species as a hive mind and so they had a certain designation that did not allow for individual differences within the group i think we all know in the real world tons of examples of that where a country of people is considered to be one group. There's a sense of uniformity to the culture when every culture has layers. And unfortunately, as much as she thinks that she is helping with this little smuggling mission, smugglers in general, the people she works with, usually have other nefarious reasons as opposed to altruistic to helping people. And so she comes to a point where she has to make a decision. And the decision is really key to the overall themes of this work because the pressure point she had put on herself was individual survival at any cost. She was going to get out, put herself first, always. You have to put yourself first to survive. But there are limits to that. And there are moments and there are crisis points when we are challenged to reflect and perhaps reframe how we think about survival. And that's what the story is really about. There is a generosity to a lot of the elements in it. It has a little bit of a, a fable quality to it because of the way that one element works out in uh, our protagonist's favor. But it is just so beautifully done in terms of establishing a world we can understand because it is thematically similar to issues in the world that we live in while offering some imaginative delights as well. So a really well done piece. Gosh, and they keep coming. So the next one is by Rich Larson. Uh, Rich Larson might be one of the most famous writers who publishes in uh, Clark's world. You might have seen a Love, Death, and Robots episode based on one of his other stories in the publication. So that talks a little bit to how much Clark's world has impact uh, and influence on the rest of the genre. But Rich Larson has a range of stories. I will say some of his stories are a little bit more abstracted and challenging, difficult to enter, because he does like to focus on imagining future realities, space-oriented uh, the vast majority of the time, that negotiate concepts of intelligence and uh, group intelligence, ship's intelligence, hive mind intelligence, larger than life intelligences in a way that can sometimes lead to very 
very challenging in medias res vocabularies. So you are thrown into a world that can feel very different, extremely different from the one that we know on, a, on the level of vernacular, on the level of naming objects or concepts within the universe. This story is one of his more accessible, and it's a lot of fun. I, I almost want to suggest that it's a, a great starting point if you've never read anything by Rich Larson because it has a lot of seasoned, nuanced elements that resonate with anxieties today uh, in terms of quote-unquote AI technology and the possibilities of digital technology to lead to hacking, to leading to danger to children especially. There's a lot of concern right now about the impact of technology for children online and that this story beautifully ties into those anxieties while still being set in this far-flung sort of dystopian future where people live in this one block uh, residential block and are constantly trying to defend from somebody from the other block stealing their children maybe to, to cannibalize them. There's, there's a mythology built into this rigid tough existence and in it we have this child Holly. She's six years old, little kid, and she has an older sister who considers her to be a sociopathic brat as older sisters sometimes do and who just wants to make out with her boyfriend instead of taking care of her all the time and a mom who has to work and yet for about a year the little child has also had another buddy a digital friend and at first people thought oh it's just part of her gore tunes it's part of just the media landscape you dump you plunk the kid in front of this technology she's got the goggles on leave her let her be and you're fine you're off you can go off and mac with your boyfriend or you can go off to work and the kid's got technology right i can feel maybe a lot of parental figures on the other side cringing a little bit because that's one of our anxieties in this modern age is the impact of leaving our kids with tech. And sure enough, this little pirate friend who wants to take Holly on a pirate adventure might not necessarily uh, have her best interest in mind. And there's this tension, this line, this anxiety as he has prepared her for this adventure day where she's going to steal out and make her way up to the bad block, the dangerous parts, the silent tower, these scary spaces that are usually off limits. And he helps her every step of the way uh, while the rest of her family slowly starts to clue into what's happening and to try to come after her too. And while other uh, items in the overall environment are searching for her. What makes the story work, well, a few things. Uh, the voice is fantastic when it comes to Holly's interactions with her pirate friend. This delicate interplay of Holly really feeling kind of bratish sometimes and feeling like she's in control when she is a child and at certain moments being scared like a child and being stunned like a child because her sense of play and reality is not quite refined enough yet. And so you've got the very strong character voices, which is good. You also have this strong tension carried through the full, like it's a longer piece and it is an engaging read. You really don't know who is on the right side of uh, this child's future. Who has the best intentions here? It's very much until the very last point, you're not entirely sure if what is being promised or, or who is pursuing this particular child um, is is something for the, her benefit, for the benefit of the people around them, the culture in general. Those tension points are so beautifully suspended until the very end. It is an engaging read. So that's a, a nice long piece. Oftentimes in Clark's World you'll see a longer piece or maybe two longer pieces and they're offset by some shorter ones. And this issue runs a full range. But I will say that the shortest piece and the longest piece in this, I this issue are both delights. So when the pieces are accepted, it's not so much about the length as it is about obviously the quality. And yet, the ability to publish longer works also means having the income stream. So if you want longer engaging works, you need to have enough income to be able to support the author. Otherwise, they're all going to be short microfiction, which is what you get from uh, a lot of other publications today, precisely because it's expensive. So if a lot of publications have very short word limits compared to a few others, it's because of how daunting it is to try to maintain uh, a payment model for longer work. It takes 
it took Clark's World a long time to be able to publish more uh, uh, longer novellas as, as well because there are actual material realities to publishing. Okay, the next piece, The Arborist by Derek Bowden, is again our lovely Holy Triumvirate. This was probably the best example of it playing out. We have a, an artificial intelligence of a kind uh, that is monitoring, it is the arborist, it is the caretaker for a quote-unquote tree, which is not quite like the trees that we have here, but it is a, an engineered construct that is holding back a lot of the endemic life on a planet that humans want to settle. And even the story is really good about this. It talks about how there's this language that's used about invasive species. It's keeping invasive species back. But who is the invasive species here? The humans who are on their way to, to colonize this space need a lot of these other species to be, dis, to be eliminated or to be, at least be suppressed. And this tree is providing that function of preparing the world. And it has its minders, some of whom are human and then we have the, um, the core character, this artificial intelligence as well. And it's this beautiful meditation on virality, who belongs, who doesn't, who is invasive and who isn't, what kind of life is to be given priority, and do we have the right to wipe out other life just so that we may advance? And if so, to what extent? Is there a push and pull? Is there a a sort of interim position where we can have some struggle in life and yet others species also get a chance to continue struggling too. So really good meditation on those themes, the tension between the three, uh, and the added benefit is the fact that we are getting some non-human mechanical intelligences involved too in this question of of which kinds of human of organic life are acceptable or not. I think that's an excellent touch too because the virus itself, the concept of a virus is itself something that's not quite organic in the same way that other uh, non-human intelligences are organic. So there are a lot of different concepts in our vocabulary, our weaponized terminology comes strongly into play in thinking about the solution to this problem. The next piece, as always, I've mentioned this before, Clark's World does translations, and it was definitely been important to advancing translated work in our genre. So a lot of times publications would not accept translated work because they couldn't pay the translator appropriately or they would split the fee between translator and uh, author. And this really limited the possibilities for bringing in work from other contexts. But uh, definitely Clark's World was one of the publications that was spearheading change and did spearhead change to bring in uh, better payment models and more work in translation. That's because Clark's World does emphatically strive to be more international in its approach and I think it's done an excellent job of that by trying to naturalize better payment models for the actual creators. Beautiful. And this one is this very tender piece. This is more of a, a meditative gentle read. The Rambler by Shen Dacheng is translated by Kara Healy and it is about a bridge that just one day decides to start moving its little legs, the, its supports, and walk away. And it imagines a world responding to this very strange event, a bridge just starts walking, in a way that helps us to estrange ourselves from what we take for granted every day. We are surrounded by buildings, we're surrounded by these, these not mechanical, but artificial elements of our environment. And obviously they're not all going to come to life, but they are a part of the life that we live. And when we take them for granted as just an everyday part of our ecosystem, we're not really thinking about the fact that they exist because of our desires, because of our, our manifested will to do something that isn't possible in the natural uh, world around them. We create these structures, we infuse them with meaning, and this story takes it one further by suggesting that, and then at some point, maybe these entities, these elements of our environment might make meaning for themselves. Um, but even then, the meaning that they make is going to echo the meaning of all of the people whose desires and everyday use of these objects goes into it. So it's playful, 
It's not about trying to solve any big problems, but it allows you to sit with a, scent, a moment of estrangement from the everyday world. So that's quite nice. The next story, uh, Occurrence at 01339 by Kelly Jennings, is a delight. It is a very quick read, and it's a fun read. It is an encounter with an alien sphinx. But when I say alien sphinx, I have to be careful because even though the sphinx is an animal construct, here we have an artificial intelligence of some kind. It is a, a mechanical entity that has presented itself and challenged the other side of the equation to prove uh, its intelligence, to prove its, its sentience as well. The other side of the equation, even though it has a name, it's been anthropomorphized, Ruby, and she is the one that's talked about centrally in the story, is a mining unit. So we have a human construct, but not a human. <laughs> something that humans have created, this mechanical entity with high intelligence, high sentience, being asked by an alien machine intelligence to prove its sentience. And if not, all of the sentience in the uh, surroundings will be destroyed. So it has 10, 10 guesses, and it confers with other forms of mechanical intelligence to try to come up with a solution to this very fascinating problem. But it is a wonderful, playful piece reflecting on what on earth is intelligence what on earth is sentience how do we demonstrate that we are sentient are we sentient maybe we aren't who knows tiny piece wonderful reflection there's a classic sci-fi vibe to this kind of storytelling we don't we don't often get stories like this uh, today but it is a playful what if and really well situated in terms of its core actors so the tension between them is a lot of fun well done kelly uh, and I look forward to whatever I see next from Kelly Jennings for sure. The next is meditation of a different level. This one's a little bit on the spooky side and every now and then you do get some spookier work. Uh, this is the last of the stories. In The Oldest Fun by, Mata by Natalia Theodorido uh, is it's something not to try to understand, just to experience. The piece reflects on the idea that there is a mysterious game that shows up in a school and every year there are certain quote-unquote players who engage with this game and they might go missing, they might end up in a slipstream reality somewhere between the walls living as ghosts haunting uh, the school grounds as life on the school grounds goes forward. There is no clear resolution to the story in terms of a, a plot. And what it is is more of a meditation on the idea that as much as we think that these ancient games, and this is an, this, the, the premise of the story is based on a kind of storytelling, a kind of mystery or suspense or horror uh, tale from another generation, will continue, will persist, even as our technology changes. So the school grounds might change, people's technology might change, the idea of this game, the idea of this tension, this anxiety, this sight of horror will persist in whatever new realm we create. So new technology is never really going to estrange us from certain kinds of stories that we tell ourselves or that we live through in our environments. It's much more of an experimental and poetic piece than many of the others, but again, it has this sense of shifting or resisting a lot of the borders that we sometimes put up between different eras of technology. It's all human experience in the end. So that's the full range of stories that we have in this issue. And then of course we move on to the nonfiction content. So as I mentioned, D.A. Zhaolin Spires writes a lot of fiction for uh, this publication. And here there is a, an essay. And again, matches perfectly with a lot of the storytelling that comes up in the fiction realm. Uh, D.A. Jiao Inspires often writes about a specific concept uh, or, or focuses on a particular element in stories. And here in Futuristic Fruits and how our real world seems science fictional sometimes in a good way, we have this meditation on fruit and how the world is filled with fantastical elements. I should know this. When before I came to Colombia, there were certain fruits that I had never had in my life. And I was like, how did I live without you? This is amazing. This is magic. Um, but 
the world of science fiction, although it creates new items, is not really creating new wonder. So the sense of estrangement we get from our own worldly delights, the sense of excitement we get from trying something new, that feeling echoes in a lot of what we produce in the science fiction world. So it's a beautiful reflection on the fact that science fiction is never really fully removed from our moment and shouldn't be. So it is what it is. Lovely piece there in terms of thinking about how science fiction works for us as authors and as readers. Then we get to Arlie Sorg's interviews. And uh, Arlie Sorg as always has two of them here. So the first is a conversation with Sophia Samatar. And I apologize in advance if you can hear the dog barking now, which is again an intersection of non-human animal intelligence in a landscape that has been dominated by mechanical machines for the vast majority of this episode. Conversation with Sophia Samatar, The Practice, The Horizon and the Chain is her forthcoming novel. So again, these conversations are always framed around people who have new workout, but Arlie Sorg focuses strongly on mid-career authors, which is wonderful because you get a full sense of the surrounding world that has been a part of not just this person's fiction, but also their way, their lens of, of viewing the world. And obviously, uh, Samatar has many different intersections in her academic life, in her work outside of science fiction, which inform the work itself. And as she talks about the work itself uh, in this piece, the focus tends to be on the persistence of myth. So again, if you remember back to when I was talking about one of the science fiction stories in this issue that turns on a fable of the rose and the bee, this is what we're talking about, this fluid sense of storytelling irrespective of the technology of a given age. And the collection also, the collection and the article with our, um, the conversation with Arlie Sorg, they negotiate the difference between being unnamed and nameless. That's a key component in the forthcoming novel where there are characters who are unnamed, but that does not mean that they are nameless. And this should be obvious when we think about our mythic traditions where we have archetypes, when we have people who just stand in the boy. But it is something that not everyone agrees with and a lot of people prefer that the characters are named and concrete and have a, a specific context. This mythic sensibility in our writing though comes out best sometimes when we're thinking about the role that is being filled by a character in any given moment. So an interesting meditation there coming from a mid-career author with a wide range of backgrounds that are being uh, that are informing the work uh, forthcoming. The other conversation is again mid-career, yeah, an excellent career I'd say, and Lecky. Anne Leckie has had tremendous success with her, uh, with her science fiction, but Anne Leckie, even though most people might know her as a writer, is also an editor. And so she has a collection of short fiction, Lake of Souls, coming out soon. She talks with uh, Arlie Sorg about popcorn books in SF, so the idea that there are many different flavors of entertainment in SF. Uh, but mostly we also get this sense of navigating this world of science fiction from the lens of both a writer and an editor. And that brings us to the end of the content. As I mentioned, that there is the editorial, which was the better of two possible editorials, which means that there was a moment this month in which uh, Clark's World was going to possibly have to make a bigger, more serious choice. And I'm glad it didn't have to make that choice this month. But I also know that it could happen any month. So as we've talked about, wonderful work in this issue, so many good stories uh, that don't emerge from the ether. As much as we can, we have to think about the material realities of our genre. We have to think about the material inputs that cause people to try to spam a Western culture that is more affluent and as a result has more affluent regional literatures than other countries. And we have to think very much about our own uh, in sense of entitlement, where we want publications to be able to produce for free, free to read, high quality publications where the authors are well paid and yet we are not necessarily investing in these publications as much as we need to, and we're also not advocating or raising uh, a sense of alarm as much as we need to around the corporate monopolies that are making it extremely difficult to maintain high subscription levels and to see revenue uh, to keep these publications going forward. We have to look outside of our moment. I know all science fiction is about the present. Can't help but be that way. 
But if we're going to survive the present, we need to be just a little bit more prescient. And I hope we can be. So enjoy. I hope there's something in that. Thank you so much, of course, for your own support of this channel, for your support of me in other venues as well, my own Patreon, my own newsletter. I sorely appreciate your presence with all of it. And I really do hope that we can continue to have a useful conversation about genre going forward. Until next time.